So welcome everybody to the afternoon session of this conference, uh, of the conference on forecasting the future of global migration. For those of you who have connected more recently, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Julia Lendorfer. I'm the head of research and migration law at the International Organization for Migration in Austria. And we are also the national contact point of the European Migration Network. Um, and in this framework, we organize a yearly conference. So this year we're looking at whether and how global migration can be anticipated. In the morning session, we had 190 participants connected. We had a very engaging discussion around interesting topics. We explored forecasts, scenario studies, and early warning systems. We also looked at innovative approaches to forecasting by using online data searches, and we discussed possible implications of migration forecasts on Europe. This afternoon, we will focus on migration predictions and proactive migration management, with a particular focus on how migration forecasting has been used by policymakers, and alternately, how policy has influenced migration forecasting. In this first section, session, we will look at the nexus between predictions and policymaking, and I am extremely honored to be able to introduce four brilliant speakers and experts on the topic. I'm very happy to be able to welcome Britta Behrendt, who is the head of the Division for General Migration Policy at the German Federal Ministry of the Interior. Britta will speak from the perspective of the German EU presidency, which is focusing on digital transformation, to explain how monitoring of migration flows is done in Germany. I'm equally pleased to be able to present Teddy Wilkin, head of the data analysis and research sector at the European Asylum Support Office, EASO. Teddy leads several large projects aimed at understanding and predicting flows of asylum seekers to and within the EU so that the agency can, pro can provide targeted operational support to member states. Teddy will present EASO's focus on early warning and forecasting systems and how to bridge the gap between data science and policymakers at the national level. I would like to extend a special thank you to Michael Clemens, who is connecting from Washington, D.C., and it is still early morning for him. Michael Clemens is the Director of Migration, Displacement, and Humanitarian Policy and a Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development, where he studies the economic effects and causes of migration around the world. Today, he will present results from two recent papers, which look at the effects of economic development on migration. And to complete this outstanding panel, we are particularly happy to welcome Matthias Czajka, Professor of Migration and Integration and the Head of the Department for Migration and Globalization at Danube University in Austria. Matthias will conclude the set of presentations by providing a view on how to address and reduce uncertainties in migration forecasting, particularly for policymaking. Each presenter will speak for 10 to 12 minutes, um, and after each presentation, we will have a very brief Q&A session. This is mainly for clarification questions, because we would like to reserve 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the four presentations for a panel discussion. Uh, to ensure uninterrupt, un uninterrupted presentations, participants are muted, um, but we really do encourage you to engage. Please ask questions via the chat on the bottom right side of your screen. I will then channel your questions to the speakers, and please make sure to really send your questions to all participants so we can all read them and they also can come directly to me. Um, please don't use this channel uh, for connection issues or IT issues. Uh, write either directly to the host or to the EMN Austria email address, which will also be posted in the chat. There's also an e-signature list, um, which will be shared in the chat, so please uh, make us a favor and sign it. We'd really uh, like to know who participated today. And finally, both the PowerPoint slides and the recording uh, will be made available to you after the conference on our website. So without further ado, I have the pleasure uh, to hand uh, over the virtual podium to Britta. Britta, I think you're muted. Now it's better? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I did it. <laughs> Yeah, actually, for me, it's the first time to do such a conference um, from my home because usually I'm at my office every day now. <laughs> Maybe I'm one of the only ones who stays at the office like every day, but today I'm at home because there's a huge strike going on in Berlin. 
So I get started right now. When we're looking at uh, applying forecasts uh, in Germany, I would like to start with a general um, background information on the monitoring of migration in Germany. So I get to the first slide. Um, for the regular situation and monitoring of migration movement, we created, uh, or my team created, a cooperation platform, uh, a network, so to say, of all the relevant authorities. It's a network of migration experts from the relevant ministries. My ministry of interior is the host of this network. And there are like other ministries involved, like the foreign office, the ministry for economic cooperation and development, ministry of defense, ministry of justice and finance. And I think that's nearly all. And there are the relevant agencies involved as well. This network focuses on monitoring migration routes and the migration situation in the countries of origin and the transit country. It's right now focuses mainly on now casting, but also contains some prognostic elements of future migration dynamics, but mainly based on expert assessment. One key institution involved in this process is the Joint Analysis Center called GASM, which is a kind of cooperation platform. It's not an agency, it's a platform, a cooperation platform. And uh, to this platform, a part of this platform are all the relevant agencies. And maybe I get to the next slide to, so you get a better picture of this. The participating authorities are the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees, the Foreign Office, the Federal Police, the Federal Criminal Police Office, Domestic Intelligence, Foreign Intelligence, and Central Customs Authority. So they are based in Potsdam at the um, Federal Office uh, of Federal Police Office, but they do cooperate in a kind of platform based approach. The focus uh, is um, to exchange, the main focus clearly is to exchange information between the different authorities and there are different sources for the information used. You can see it like national sources, Frontex sources, Europol, national asylum statistics and so on. But we do not use personal data. This is really important. No personal data is being used in this, uh, in the GASM, as we call it. So here you get the picture. It's a really nice old building. And you see again all the participants, but I already told you who the participants are. It's not, uh, it's not really easy, but it was, uh, I think for Germany, it was a really important step to create this platform because it guarantees uh, in-time exchange of information. And you, as you might have realized, there, there are these two um, actors or players, this cooperation platform, the GASM, and this um, network of migration experts. And the network of the migration experts is it's more the ministerial level, it's like my colleagues from the other, other ministries uh, participating in these meetings and they take place like every six weeks. And the GASM, the cooperation platform, is, as you might call it, the operational heart of this process. So they produce reports and ad hoc reports. So they are really the operational heart of it all. When it comes to migration forecasting, we are still, we as Germany are still at the beginning of a process because um, in this migration network of experts, we realized that we until now mainly focus on now casting and only sometimes have a look at the future. But we all realized that this has to be changed to be a little bit more strategic and to be prepared for um, strategic changes. 
So we realized that uh, members of this network have already created kind of migrate forecasting tools. But these tools were like, for example, there is a tool of the Foreign Office called Preview. There's another tool of the Foreign Intelligence Service and another tool of the Ministry of Defense. But those tools, they were created like within the last one or two years, I would say. They mainly focus on crisis prediction and conflict prediction. So only the um, tool of the Federal Intelligence Service focuses in part on migration as well. So we realized that we um, need a coherent approach to migration forecasting. And uh, I would like to tell you how we did this. So I get to the next slide. Because instead of creating kind of theoretical um, discussions first, we, um, we took a kind of hands-on approach, I would call it, because we um, organized a meeting of experts and um, we created a task, a common task for all of these three tools. So we said we want to have a kind of pilot prediction. So all the three tools, they had to uh, analyze the same situation. They had a look at um, the region, which was like agreed upon that it was North Africa, including Egypt, and an agreed timeline, like six months. And then they all had to uh, work on their task. And they had like four weeks time or three weeks time. And then we had a meeting and all the different actors, they, they presented their results and we, are still analyzing uh, the next steps because it's clearly that they had like different views on the and different perspectives. And at the end of the day, there was a broad consensus that we we would like to share the experiences and the different approaches to create a new tool focusing on migration forecasting. So it was really kind of pragmatic way. So we want to start now with this process. And at the national level, we want to start taking two steps. Right now we have the first step, is this one, we agreed that all the actors, the three actors, they um, present their tools to the garden, to this cooperation platform, and they start immediately to um, check if they can use the results or the reports right now. This is the first step using the existing tools, which mainly focus on crisis prevention for the GASM. And the second step will be that we get together and um, create, create a common tool for migration forecasting by cooperating with our partners from the other ministries, and we would like to um, have this new tool at our um, at our federal office for migration management. But this is still we are still at the very beginning because it was just agreed upon like this week or last week that we will choose this road, and it's really work in progress, and we get started. And uh, our main focus is to cooperate and. Uh, have this kind of migration forecasting tool as a, uh, to get a broader sensorium, I would like to call it. Just, it's just, for, for us, it's not like being able to uh, get absolute clarity on the future. It's about having a different perspective, uh, perspective which might be really fruitful to get to better preparedness on the national level. And then, the really interesting point is the European level, because as you all know, the new migration pact was like uh, presented this week, and we are really happy what we read about the blueprint on migration management and, and crisis preparedness. And I think uh, Susanna will tell us a little bit about that later on. But we, as the German presidency, we are really um, glad 
to be part of this process. And I think putting kind of effort into this preparedness and being able to be a bit more strategic at an early stage, it's, it's really, really, really important for all of us. And I think we all agree on that point. So what's ahead? Let's just look. Yeah, and we during the presidency, as we started, as you might know, on the 22nd of July with the Migration 4.0 event. And the aim of this was to support the digital transformation and migration management. And, and one aspect we focused on was using big data for migration forecasting, as well as you know. So we're really happy to, to continue with this process. We have a mapping process going on with all the member states, and we will present the results in maybe one of the next FIFA meetings. We will have step out sessions, conferences. And so we are really happy to be in part of this and uh, our aim is to support and accelerate the implementation of the blueprint because I think it's really important for, for the whole migration issue as a whole. I think um, from getting from crisis to comprehensive management based on preparedness, this is a really valuable goal for all of us. And don't forget, think it digitally from the start because we always have to keep in mind that it has to be digital at the end of the day. Having written reports is nice, but I think it's kind of old fashioned and we and we have to get to a platform solution at the end of the day. I think that's the way ahead. So maybe one last slide. Yeah, and uh, at, at the end of the German presidency, we have on the 11th of December, we will have a follow up on the migration 4.0 conference and I hope we will be able to present to you uh, some of the results of our national process and uh, some results of the European process as well. So it's then it's the end of the German presidency, but it's not the end of the transformation. Keep on going and I'm really happy to hear maybe Teddy as the next one. But first of all, I want to give the word back to you, Julia. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brita. I think it's always fascinating to learn how a member state and a nation state deals with these kind of questions and issues. And so thank you so much for sharing really those insights from the ministry. Um, there are no questions in the chat. Please do feel free to, to pose questions. I do have a few questions for you, Britta. So I would be really interested to understand um, a little bit the time frame, how you're, what you think. You said that you're doing now casting now, so um, basically very short term, but how far do you propose to look into the future with the models that you're developing? We also heard in the morning a lot about uncertainty, uh, that there are a lot of elements of uncertainty in any predictive method. Um, and I would be really interested how you are thinking and your team is thinking about uncertainties and how they can be built into, into the German approach. And lastly, um, you mentioned a bit the policy aims, but maybe you can describe these in more detail. So is it really more a policy aim to look at sort of um, asylum seekers or refugee flows, or are you also looking at potentially understanding uh, family migration, labor migration, sort of these mid to longer term trends better? So I think you're still muted, Britta. Yes. Okay. Are you unmuted me again? <laughs> Thank you. So when it comes to the time frame, right now, what we're doing this kind of work we do right now is I think we're looking what might happen in the winter time. So it's more kind of uh, just expert knowledge. But with our migration forecasting tool, which you want to uh, develop in the next month or maybe in the next year, it's going to be quite a long process at the end of the day, I think. But I think we aim at, at, uh, at having forecasts from like about six months to one year. So that would be our starting point. But I think we're going to, this process will be a long journey. And I think we're really happy to have this close cooperation between the policymakers and the guys who have to <laughs> create the tools. So we, it's going to be kind of 
laboratory, ongoing laboratory, because we are having a kind of cooperation all the time and dialogue is key for this process. So I think we will have to keep on adjusting the thing all the time. Maybe it's, it's, it's I think it's a process without an end because you always have to adjust the tool to your needs. And um, yeah, therefore, but right now, we would like to develop a tool for like six months or one year. But I think it's an ongoing process. Then your second question about uh, uncertainty and certainty. I, I had an idea when I had a look at your program because you said this today our session is the nexus between prediction and policy making. Um, from my point of view, it's more about the nexus between the fact finders and the decision takers, because that's from my point of view the key part of it. You have to decide and you have to act. And it's not about just monitoring and knowing about the situation. You have to create the nexus to create action and to create help for people in need, because at the end of the day, this tool is not just about early warning and um, preventing people from coming to our countries. It's, it's about helping people in, the, in wherever they are. So I think it's a very po it can be a really positive thing at the end of the day, but you have to always keep in mind that we're talking about people, even if our language sometimes is a little more, bit more, um, uh, how to call it, it's like when we're talking about early warning, we have mm -hmm. in, in mind that we're talking about people at the end of the day. Right. So, and that's maybe uh, when when I was explaining about the German process, it's, it's really a very pragmatic one. It's not about analyzing migration flows on a kind of abstract scale. It's about that's happening in in this country and and what can be done and who is able to finance the action. So it's really com it's really concrete and. At the end of each meeting, we're identifying what has to be done, who is responsible for the action, and who is able to, to put the money into the action. And, and then it's really, we have a list and we do controlling as well, because from my experience, otherwise it, it, it just, just doesn't work. And I think this is the positive thing about the blueprint plans from my point of view, because it's not just about monitoring the blueprint, it's about crisis preparedness as well. So it's a nexus between monitoring and acting. And this is really key from my point of view. And then, yeah, and the then last maybe, question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe just in, the, uh, in one minute, Britta, because we need to yeah. move. But thank you. Yeah. yeah, you know, I'm so euphoric about the thing. <laughs> no, the last question was about what do we want to monitor? I think we will start with this project with a monitoring uh, irregular migration. It's not about monitoring um, legal migration in, in like of working people like try, who want to come to Germany to work. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's, it's work in progress and we have to see how it develops. Thank you very much. That was a really comprehensive insight. So we will move now from uh, a member state to the EU. And with that, to Teddy Wilkin uh, to give us some insight on the EU's effort in providing up to date forecasts for policymaking. Teddy, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to come and present today. Okay, I'm just looking to uh, share my screen. You tell me when you can see something relevant. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, okay, that's splendid. Okay, so um, ESA is, um, has invested heavily in the last couple of years in, uh, in uh, forecasting migration. Um, we're not going to talk a great deal about the system that we've designed today. I'm going to go rather quickly through that, um, but I'm really going to try and uh, concentrate a little bit on this nexus between uh, evidence and, uh, and policy. So that will come towards the end of the, of the presentation. We've we've covered a lot of ground already, which which um, which I'm very pleased to see. Um, I don't think I need to inter introduce too much the, com the the complexity of migration, you know, except to say that, you know, it's jolly complex and really hard to uh, to predict in 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 any meaningful way. Uh, there's a lot of unknown unknowns. 
Um, usually, understanding comes after the event. And when we learn about one type of mixed migration flow, let's say about the particular drivers, um, those lessons are not necessarily transferable to, um, to other situations. So really, all of the work is in, is, is in front of us. And um, I think, as uh, Ravenna said at the beginning, there's never going to be an absolute uh, crystal ball. So we have to uh, work together and do the best we can to talk about the, the future in, in, in at least a sensible way. We heard Jakob talk about different types of uncertainty, um, which, we're, which we're fully in line with, of course. Um, uh, we understand very well that the data are often scattered and low quality and on off. Um, and the now casting is really important, and this is full of the epistemic um, um, uncertainty. And uh, this is even more so when we, when we try and talk about the future. Um, I will, I will move on, I think, and I'll talk a little bit about our analytical framework. Because um, uh, as, we, as we heard earlier, it's best not to have a single tool with lots of very precise forecasts um, upon which policy is built or operational responses. It's best to have a kind of toolbox. And so in IASO, uh, we've, we've built exactly this. So, so we look backwards with traditional data and we do the now casting. And this is where we describe the trends in a descriptive way, and we do our best to uncover um, the drivers. Um, an example of this is the um, uh, EASO asylum report, which is available online. What we've been hearing quite a lot about today is, is the forecasting systems. Um, so this is where EASO has, has, has also invested heavily. This is where we use, you know, um, uh, innovative uh, big data at scale, and we try and combine that traditional data um, to do uh, forecasting. I'll, I'll talk more about that. And uh, we've also heard quite a bit about scenarios. Um, this is where we pull together um, experts and talk about a range of different plausible futures. Um, and yes, I invested heavily in this and published a report last year, which, um, which we'd like to repeat. And we pulled together large numbers of, um, of, of, of experts. We didn't ask them, do you think this flow is going to increase or that flow is going to decrease? Instead, we, and we subjected them to a, a rather rigorous uh, methodology of uh, futurologists. And um, anyway, um, uh, all the um, uh, scenarios are included in that report. So I'm going to talk mostly about the middle column of this toolbox, uh, the forecasting. And if we look at the different um, uh, uh, data sources that we use, um, one of the main ones is, uh, is the GDELT project. So this is um, a global database of, of events as reported in uh, print and electronic media. So the best way to think about this data source is when you, when you search on Google, uh, you can search the web, you can also search um, images, you can also search for the news. And so there's data behind that. And so this is the data that we download. We download it uh, every day, um, and we, the events are classified into 300 different types of events. Um, and we concentrate on the negative and disruptive events, um, and we use that to, tr to try and estimate a little bit of what we call push factors. So this chart shows us a little bit of push factors that comes from those data for each of the provinces in um, in, in, in Turkey. We've also been doing this recently when it comes to Lebanon after the explosion on the 4th of August and, and also in Belarus at the moment. So this is a really um, uh, uh, interesting system for looking at uh, the extent to which countries are under you know, this kind of intent to migrate, which we've heard a lot about today, but we're looking at actual, actual events. Um, the second source of data we use that we've also heard quite a bit about it today, and this is the Google Trends. Um, so uh, these data are available. Every, every search we do on Google is recorded, as we know, and these data are, are made available to, um, to researchers and, and, and analysts in one form or another. So, so we download loads of these data as well, um, and um, a, a sudden change in the extent to which um, a bunch of search topics um, are, are, are used in a certain country uh, we can use that as an early warning sig signal as well. So all of these data, uh, we scale um, to a weekly frequency, um, and we use them to try and predict 
or at least to correlate with applications for asylum in the European Union. Um, the methodology is quite complicated, but first of all, we create some time lags between the events and the applications for asylum uh, in Europe, because we don't expect them to happen in the same week, obviously. And then we use a, um, a machine learning algorithm, an adaptive, so that means it's unsupervised elastic net model uh, to sift through these uh, huge amounts of data and uncover, uncover um, some of the correlations. Um, and we notice which events are correlated um, with applications in the EU, and we monitor those. And we issue alerts when, um, when these events um, suddenly increase. And these go into the model and help us do some short-term forecasting. Um, so how to translate and communicate these results? Well, we have the data science, uh, but we don't let the data science lead the building very much. Um, instead, we've inserted um, additional layers in between of, um, let's say, migration analysts uh, that check to make sure that the data science is really describing real-world events. Um, and we translate the results into easy to understand repeatable narratives that go into different reports. Uh, we've done a joint report with IOM recently, joint reports with, uh, with member states, um, and we really think that that's, that that's the way to, to move forward at this time when lots of different organizations have slightly different methodologies. Two of the outputs that we use, well, okay, on the left, uh, this is where policy makers uh, sit, if you like. They're, they would prefer to look at longer term trends. Um, along the bottom of this, of this heat map on the left, we have uh, weeks. So this is going back 12 months. And on the vertical axis, we have different uh, drivers and different uh, data streams. And where there's a red box, it's highly correlated. So we see here in the bottom left-hand corner, this particular migration flow was, uh, was at the beginning of the year was correlated with those um, drivers in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, but slowly throughout the year, the drivers are slowly changed, and, and so at the end of the year, um, uh, the, the, this migration flow was correlated with different drivers. Um, from this, we think we can start to inform uh, policymakers about what are really the, uh, uh, the root causes, you know, the, um, and, uh, and underpinning specific migration events. Um, and on the right-hand side, for our operational colleagues, uh, we can do short-term forecasts with a, with a reasonable degree of um, uh, certainty, um, but policymakers aren't interested in what's going to happen a few weeks in advance. Uh, so we have to try and build a system that um, that uh, uh, has outputs for for all, for all our colleagues. So when it comes to the relationship with policy, well, I've mentioned already that we don't allow the data science to lead the building. Um, this is because policymakers tend to talk about um, uh, the spirit of the regulation, uh, nuances, um, arguments, um, loopholes, um, they don't talk in numbers. So we really, we really have to invest on finding the middle ground um, so that we can communicate our evidence uh, to them. We do have to manage expectations because, as we've heard already today, there's no crystal ball. We tend to deal in probabil uh, probabilities, whereas um, not just policymakers, but also journalists and politicians prefer things to be very much in black and white. But that's not, that's not what we talk about at all. We don't talk about services. I've mentioned already time horizons. So for policy makers, they require a longer time horizon. Um, we've always already spoken about today black swans, um, uh, which have a huge impact, which, which are unforeseen. So we could say the Arab Spring. We could say the war in Syria. Uh, we could see COVID-19 as well, which um, none of us predicted. Um, an important point I'd like to make is, you know, we're constantly under pressure to produce or help produce evidence-informed policy. But this is a two-way street. We'd also like to see policy coming out that helps us produce better evidence. So it's fine for the policymakers to come out and say, okay, we've, we've released, um, uh, you know, this, um, this new legislative instrument. But if that instrument doesn't contain better data collection, then don't come to us in a year's time and say, okay, now we want to understand how well the policy is working. So please bring, bring, bring people like us to the table and let us help you design a policy which will help um, uh, create better evidence. I've gone over time, so I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot. It's really interesting, Teddy. Thank you. And I think we have a lot of policymakers listening at the moment, so I hope oh. your, your call uh, has arrived somewhere. 
Um, Teddy, thank you for this insight into ELSA's work. I think that's, uh, that's really quite special that you're able to share this with us. We do have two questions for you. So one is from Arvid Zeng from the Swedish Migration Agency. Uh, we wanted to get some additional information about whether IASO actually also makes uh, prognosis and assessments on the number of asylum seekers in Europe or coming to Europe, um, because many EU countries try to predict the number of asylum seekers in their respective countries. So, so how IASO uh, works with that? And maybe I can also read you the second question, which is from André Gröger. Uh, who presented earlier this morning, and he's referring to the graph on Turkey and would like to know which type of push factors would be included or do you expect to capture in the data that you show in the Turkey graph and whether you could give some context why Ankara is showing such high index levels during this time. Okay, fine. Thanks. Okay, so they're both very good questions. So the first question, do we do we release actual numbers? Mostly, mostly we don't. Um, Although that that can be done, and we have done that recently in the um, in the context of COVID. So um, you know, in uh, in in April, May, June, numbers of asylum applications lodged in Europe fell um, to historically low levels. And so now we're in a situation where we're doing doing forecasts until the end of the year, and with some reasonably simple arithmetic, we can easily come up with three scenarios um, for the rest of the year, that they stay low, that they return to normal, or they return to normal plus uh, all the applicants who were prevented from applying for asylum in, 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 in uh, April, May, and June. Um, so, you know, pushing forward our understanding of the present into the near future is not very hard. You can do that with extrapolations. You can do that with um, uh, with, with uh, different techniques. It, it's not something that we do a lot of. Instead, we are looking to try and understand the drivers, um, and we look to forecast those drivers and see how, how the assignment trends uh, would work. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is a preference that we've chosen. Um, also, because we don't want to, um, you know, uh, um, um, give the impression that, that we have a degree of certainty when we're talking about um, actual numbers. Um, when we talk about the, uh, the push factor map for Turkey, so there's a lot going on there. So we use 240 different types of event, um, uh, and uh, um, um, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what events were the main drivers. They would be different in each of the provinces. Um, this particular map that I showed is not controlling for population size. So when there's more population, there's more events. Um, but we have done a lot of work also in a, in a joint publication with IOM um, to control for population size. And what we also do in, in, in Turkey is we know very well the number of Syrians registered in each of these provinces. They may not be present, but we know the number of um, uh, registered Syrians under temporary protection. So we can also look at the number of events per, per capita in that way, um, which adds a lot of value, I think. Excellent. Thank you very much, Teddy. So then um, I would like to move to the next speaker, Michael Clemens. Thank you so much for joining us from Washington. Um, we really appreciate that you've made the time so early in the morning. So, so Michael Clemens will now speak about the effects of economic development on migration, or which is also sometimes known as the external dimension. Michael, over to you. So I think you're still muted. Try to unmute. Michael? You you can't hear me. Oh, I can hear you. Yes. Great. Thank you. I, okay. I, I apologize. I'm not one of these professors that is really good at this right now. Uh, uh, th thank you so much for uh, to, to you, Yulia, to, to Lucas, to to all of you for the chance to learn from you. There's so much expertise of, uh, about this area from uh, data scientists, demographers, uh, sociologists uh, at this meeting, and uh, what can an, an economic historian like me uh, contribute. I want to talk about uh, what, what some people would, would think of as the very long term. I think of it as the medium term, which is the, the next 10 to 30 years, uh, and the, the relationship between between emigration and uh, development economic development in, in migrant countries of origin over that time period. So I'm thinking of uh, children who are about 10 right now 
uh, when they are making migration decisions, how will their decisions be related to economic development in the countries they, they come from? Now, for, uh, for a lot of people, and it's uh, entirely reasonable, uh, this question has a very obvious answer. When you're in a migrant destination country and you see many, many uh, uh, people around who have chosen to uh, not to live and work in the countries they, they come from where there's limited economic opportunity, but instead to take advantage of opportunities in destination countries, uh, it just stands to reason that when there is more economic opportunity in those places, uh, uh, fewer people will be making that decision. Uh, uh, absolutely entirely reasonable, and I want to argue that there's a sense in which that's absolutely true, but I want to co confront that with two uh, facts. So here's one. Yulia mentioned that these are coming from two research papers. I'll give a link to my website at the end. This one is from uh, a paper joint with Maria Pia Mendola at the University of Milan Bicocca, uh, and this is looking uh, across people here. Uh, th this is a, a survey data across individual people. It's from the Gallup World Poll. So you're looking at a, a data from 125,000 uh, individuals uh, in 24 low-income countries. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Ethiopia is in here, Mali is in here, uh, Afghanistan is in here. That, that uh, orange hump is the distribution of, uh, of income at the respondent level, uh, where zero is the, is the mean for, for the for each country, and that blue line is the probability that a person at each level of income uh, tells the interviewer that they are making active, uh, costly steps currently to imminently prepare to, to emigrate permanently from the country that they're living in now, not uh, aspiring to immigrate in an, in an ideal world, not planning to emigrate in the next 12 months, but having said yes to both of those things, uh, making active, costly pr preparations uh, to, to be just about to leave, you can see across the income distribution uh, that not only is that not falling or kind of flat, it, it is uh, uh, enormously rising. Uh, across the whole income distribution, uh, the probability uh, roughly triples that people are, uh, are just about to emigrate. Complementing that, uh, uh, backing way, way up to the national level now, but this is macro data at, at what the unit of analysis is not people, but countries. Uh, here, the, the horizontal axis is, is uh, country-level income, average income uh, per capita uh, adjusted for prices. And the vertical axis here is the fraction of people born in that country living in any other country. So they, they were born in the country of origin, but they've emigrated. This is, uh, this is all developing countries, and it's pooled data for seven different census rounds uh, over, the, over the last uh, 60 years, uh, including up, up to present. And here again, you can see uh, uh, the countries that are middle-income countries uh, at that $10,000 level, which is roughly the level of, uh, of Tunisia or Philippines right now, uh, really quite developed uh, developing countries economically. The, the tendency to, to be living outside your country of birth is about triple than it, uh, the, what it is uh, for, for low-income countries at the, at the bottom uh, range. Now, I've, I've been pointing this out for, for many years. I, I get many uh, uh, reactions. And, uh, and all of them are, are intelligent and, and, and reasonable, and I just want to, to talk about how to think through this, uh, what to, to many people is a really strikingly uh, counterintuitive relationship. Uh, is, is this just re reflecting high-income microstates, little islands? Uh, is it mostly reflecting south-south migration? Well, we can, we can carve those things out. Uh, here's the exact same graph you saw for all immigration uh, pooled together in all of these seven uh, census rounds. If we uh, drop uh, uh, the, the lowest uh, quartile of population, countries of origin, so uh, all countries below 2.5 million uh, of population, and we count only emigration to what the World Bank defines as high-income countries, uh, the graph looks like this. So you, it, it's, uh, it's quite similar. The, the absolute rise across that income range went from six percentage points to about five percentage points. Uh, the relative rise uh, uh, greatly increased in, instead of the, the tendency to emigrate uh, roughly tripling across that range. Now it, it rises by roughly a factor of 10. So this is, this is definitely not confined to uh, unrepresentative a little slices of, of immigration. And another big question that comes up is what, what is the path of countries over time? Uh, as, as, uh, as economic development and immigration uh, evolve in a country, uh, do, do countries tend to follow that path you just uh, saw? Uh, the, 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 the path in that graph is, is not a, a snapshot at a moment of time. It, it's what we call pooled data. It combines uh, the, the, the seven census rounds over 60 years, 59 years, 
uh, and variation across countries. So it's combining variation across and within countries over time. What if we isolate country, the variation just within countries over time and trace their paths? Well, here is a, a snapshot of where, uh, where countries ended up in 2019. This is uh, all developing countries uh, that experienced positive growth uh, over this uh, over this half century, so these are these are all the developing countries that, that grew. Again, we have dropped the the tiny countries below uh, 2.5 million population, and the vertical axis here is counting just emigration uh, to high income countries. What was the path that these countries took to get where they are in this snapshot? Uh, hypothetically, if they were following a, a declining paths, this is just hypothetical arrows that I'm putting here. Uh, for example, if a if a if a doubling of of income per capita were associated with a a a, 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 a having of the tendency to live outside your country, uh, th this is what those paths would have looked like between 1970 and 2019. Now I'm going to show you the real data uh, of, uh, on where th these exact same countries uh, uh, traveled in order to arrive at the, the the snapshot you just saw. This is how they really moved uh, between 1970 and 2019. And you can see of, of, of countries that are still developing countries, that there are only three arrows on, on that entire graph that are downward sloping. The, the answer is yes, very clearly, developing countries uh, tend to follow that, uh, that, that pattern you saw in the pooled data as they individually, in their own circumstances, uh, uh, economically develop uh, over time. Another uh, common reaction is, is, well, is, is, is uh, that, sure, this is the very long run. Uh, what about the short run? Uh, a, a, a friend and a, and a brilliant uh, uh, person in the in the in uh, in Devco once told me, you know, for us the the short run is tomorrow, the the, the medium run is three months from now, and the long run is next year. Uh, you know, I as an economic historian, I think uh, of uh, something something else. But uh, uh, is, is this long run relationship, which is over decades, that you've been looking at, a representative of the short run? Well, it it, it must be in in a sense, in a particular sense, which is that. Uh, the, the, the long run relationship you just saw is a composition of many short run relationships. So the, if, if, you, if, if, if you drive for four hours and in the short run, each hour you're getting closer to Budapest, uh, leaving Vienna, uh, there, there is no way that in the long run, in four hours, you're going to end up in Munich. Uh, at some point you need to be moving west uh, in, in each of those short run uh, single hour relationships in order for the long run relationship to be that you end up in Munich. So if it isn't, if it is in fact the case that does a downward sloping relationship in the short run at any, at any uh, very specific moment in time, in the long run, uh, if countries are to behave as they have in the past, then, uh, then the, the, the average short run relationship must, uh, must also be positive. And that, that's just a point of, of math. Um, Another very common uh, reaction, and this is a very reasonable reaction, is, well, th this is, is this a causal relationship? Are we just looking at a correlation data and, and not, uh, not causation? I, I do want to point out that in the 99 countries where individual level exists for the first graph you saw in this presentation, uh, that, that upward uh, uh, slope of the, of the tendency to be preparing to migrate across income, that occurs in 93 of the 99 countries. And in the arrows that you just saw, uh, there, there were only three of those countries that are still developing countries. So I'm not including uh, uh, Greece, for example. Uh, uh, there are only three of those countries that, that are downward sloping. So the, the nearly universal experience of development is that these two things are associated. And that should that, that certainly places a, a, a strong burden of proof uh, on, uh, on those who would assert that, that the mechanisms of economic development over the next 10, 20, 30 years are going to be so radically fundamentally different than they have been in the past that they will, that they will generate a, a, uh, a, uh, a relationship between these two things that is of the, of the opposite uh, sign. That's hypothetically possible. I, I don't think any of us have a good reason to believe that. Uh, another, uh, 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 very uh, uh, useful and, and interesting reaction. Well, how much of this is, what is the relationship between uh, uh, irregular migration, uh, specifically in economic development, because that's of strong positive interest, uh, po policy interest, I should say. The, the, the most direct answer is that all the data that you're seeing in this presentation, uh, in the way the data are collected, attempt to uh, comprise both uh, forms of migration, irregular and irregular uh, lumped together. So they, they don't, uh, they're, they are not necessarily informative about patterns in, in irregular migration. There's a, there's a, a, a notable uh, new paper at, uh, at IZA by uh, Aksoy and Pudvara that attempts to, to measure uh, 
tendencies of this kind, focusing migrant selection, specifically in irregular migrants, uh, uh, among irregular migrants. Um, and, uh, and that's an area where, where a lot more research needs to be done. Of course, irregular migration is, is inherently difficult to measure. I do want to point out that, that uh, the irregularity of migration is, a, a, in part, a consequence of policy. So in, in order to, if we were to shape policy based on, on forecasts about irregular migration that are, in fact, that are themselves shaped by policy, there's a little bit of circular reasoning. And it's, it's a little bit like, uh, like uh, setting a, a, a minimum age uh, in, in, in Austria at which you can buy vodka, uh, 18 years old, and then uh, interviewing people who are 17 uh, who are illegally buying vodka uh, 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 in extra legal circumstances and asking, well, what is it fundamentally about them that is making them uh, buy vodka in these, in these extra legal irregular circumstances? You know, is it their lack of education? Is it a fundamental lack of maturity? No, no. The the fact that they are 17 and 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 buying irregularly is 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 shaped by the policy which makes uh, the the uh, the the regular channels to buy vodka at 17 unavailable to them. So uh, that's that's something we certainly need to take strongly into account if if we are to study the determinants of irregular migration and use it to shape policy, which determines which itself determines our uh, regularity. Finally, I. Uh, and uh, I hope I have just a couple of minutes to, to, to wrap up. Um, a, 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 a real reaction I got from a, a, a brilliant and highly experienced uh, uh, expert uh, in Brussels was, look, I have talked to migrants and they tell me themselves that if they had more economic opportunity, they wouldn't have left, you know, you think they're lying to me. And that's absolutely not. Uh, and, and this is where I want to get to the, the, the point that there is a sense in which, uh, in which that's absolutely correct. Um, first of all, we we just need to disabuse ourselves of the of the of the model in our heads uh, that this is about individual choice. And to, the 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 best way I know of to do this is to show you the relationship between child mortality and emigration. So the vertical axis here is exactly the same one uh, you saw before. This is the the fraction of people in developing countries who live outside their country of birth. Uh, and the horizontal axis here is no longer economic development, it is child survival. That is the, the inverse of child mortality. This is the, the probability that a child born alive in each of the, the countries of origin makes it to age five. And you can see that uh, people are much more likely to leave countries where their children are much more likely to survive. If you think of this as an individual choice, uh, that, that, that doesn't make any sense, and that, that should make us question whether this is representing incredibly uh, complex structural shifts, uh, in this case, uh, uh, and very importantly, demographic shifts that tend to happen over the course of development or individual choice. It's obviously not the case that people prefer to stay in countries where their children are more likely to die. Uh, this, this is about uh, very complex structural shifts. And just to illustrate one of those, if you take the, the individual level data that you saw before for, uh, for um, uh, 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 low income countries only, and they were aligned at the mean, they were demeaned. Uh, here, we're not aligning them at the mean, and we're putting in data at the individual level from 99 different developing countries. This is a graph of 650,000 people's answers to the Gallup World Poll data about, about uh, migration plans. Individual income on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, the probability that people are actively preparing to emigrate, that's uh, what economic historians call the, econo the, the, the uh, emigration life cycle uh, going up and up and up until uh, you get to the median income of upper middle income countries. Separate now uh, the, uh, that, that exact same curve by education, exactly the same data. That green line is the same information for people who have attained secondary attain attainment, a secondary education, the, the red line is the, the same uh, line for people who have not attained secondary education. And you can see within each of those groups, the association between preparing to emigrate and income is either flat or downward sloping. Uh, so if you were to ask either of those people, well, if you had more economic opportunity, would you stay? They could say yes, and they'd be right. They're not lying to you. However, economic development is also a structural shift. It is not just a moving of people those curves, it is, a, it is a shift of people from the red curve to the green curve, which happens essentially universally in development. And the fact that people who are more educated tend to be more likely to emigrate uh, means that at the same time, it can be the case that in aggregate, economic development produces more uh, emigration and 
uh, any given group of people, even every single individual could correctly tell you that more economic opportunity would make them stay, stay at home. Those things are not in conflict. They can both be true. Uh, nobody's lying to you. And I just want to close with, with this thought that uh, the, the more people from developing countries that you see around over the next generation in uh, rich countries of migrant destination, uh, the more you can be sure that economic development is happening uh, in those places. The papers I've referred to are at this link, and thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Michael. and thank you so much for also um, speaking to the non-economists among us in, in very clear uh, and straightforward terms. Uh, I think you touch upon very important policy issues that um, we are all, our policymakers in Europe particularly, are grappling with. And I also have a question from a uh, policymaker for you, um, namely from Manfred Kohler from the Austrian Ministry of Interior. And he is um, interested um, whether legal migration from poor countries can really improve these countries' structural problems, he calls them. Um, and as example, he puts, he uh, refers to brain drain. So um, I think the issue he's referring to here is regarding the attraction, the attraction of talent to the EU from third countries and what effect that has on developing countries is the way I understand the question. Thank you very much. That's uh, we could spend the rest of the day talking about that. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I would, uh, I, I want to point out that there is a, there is a, 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 a fundamental disconnect in any, uh, in any d discussions of, uh, of lawful channels for migration. And, and it's that uh, for the, the reasons that, uh, that Mr. Kohler uh, accurately uh, points out, develop, uh, developing countries of migrant origin are highly suspicious of skilled migration. Uh, and the constituency uh, there is mostly for lower skilled migration. Uh, it's exactly the opposite in, in countries of migrant destination, uh, where the, the, uh, people are highly suspicious of lower skilled migration and much more welcoming of, uh, of, of higher skilled migration. Uh, I, uh, I, I think those concerns are legitimate. I, I do want to point out that there's nothing inherent about the movement of people, even skilled people, that must cause a brain drain. Uh, the, a skilled migration, if that is what Europe needs and that is what Europe is willing to admit, can be planned for and can be invested in. Uh, and uh, th there are experiments going on right now by very forward-looking aid agencies, GIZ uh, and uh, Enable in, in Belgium, uh, in partnering with migrant countries of origin to invest in skills for those people so that, number one, uh, there isn't a skill drain. The, the, the skill that are that are migrating to Europe are skills that have been invested in for that purpose and number two the people who are investing in those skills are the people who will be directly benefiting from from them which are the, the, the people at the destination so uh, absolutely this is a concern uh, in in unregulated uh, migration but there's so many opportunities that have barely been touched to regulate migration in more constructive ways uh, that uh, that uh, that legitimate concerns like mr. Kohler's should not be a reason to be suspicious of, of, of migration itself inherently Thank you very much. I think that's that's really interesting. So I think you you touched upon an interesting point that I would like to discuss again in the um, uh, in the panel discussion, namely global skills partnerships and that idea of of labor partnerships. But um, before we turn to the panel, uh, I would like to give the words to Matthias Zeiger, um, um who will talk about uncertainties and preparing for uncertain migration futures, with a specific focus on uh, policymaking and policymakers. Thank you very much, Matthias. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you and we can see the Excellent. presentation. Thank you very much, Julia, for the very kind introduction. Thank you very much um, for this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, I, I, I learned so much already today and uh, also this panel, I think, um, is, is, is uh, really fascinating um, what I've heard so far. Um, I would like to uh, take the opportunity and to talk for the next couple of minutes about the question, can we prepare for uncertain migration futures? Um, Jakub Bizek, uh, whom I collaborate with uh, on the quantum project, he has introduced it and then presented briefly this morning. Um, we have uh, worked on a sort of a typology uh, with regard to uncertainties. Um, and I would like to take it now a, little, a step further into the, the policy 
field. Um, let me just um, start with uh, the, the key issues, basically, of, of this talk. Um, first point is we, there's a, a propensity to make predictions, to know about the future, uh, and this is inherently human. We all want to know what's tomorrow, um, when will the COVID uh, situation come to an end finally, what will be uh, my next job, what will, where will we live uh, um, uh, in, 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 in reasonable future. This is inherently human. Um, when it comes to the collective, obviously this uh, uh, turns out to be um, much more complex and uh, through some accelerations and, and, and proliferation, diversification, all what, uh, what's happening at the more structural levels, um, of course, creates uh, um, impacts and, uh, and is relevant for migration processes in the future. Uh, we've also learned uh, this morning and heard several times that uh, the requirements for prediction and forecasting uh, exceed the ability to do so. And obviously, um, you know, having uh, this sort of toolbox uh, uh, with different instruments available for making meaningful um, and reasonable uh, predictions about the future, of course, is, is a very good practice, but it does not prevent predictive failure. So the key the key um, issue I would like to address here is how do we cope with predictive failure uh, in order to avoid governance failure, or how do we de-link basically um, governance failure from predictive failure? So um, I think uh, the key point here is that uh, the challenge is to design some um, sort of migration policy and governance uh, uh, structures and infrastructure that reflect the likelihood uh, of predictive failure. So in some way, not only policymakers, but all sorts of stakeholders uh, uh, need to prepare for both the trends, the likely and the unlikely trends, and obviously also the shocks and the impacts of those shocks. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, we also have to prepare to be unprepared. Let me start with this predictive failure, governance failure uh, uh, link um, with, with the COVID example. Um, this uh, is what you see here, uh, our, our scores of an index that has been developed uh, by the Center for Health Security at John Hopkins University. Um, it uh, shows the level of preparedness of uh, 195 countries in the world with regard to global health. Uh, issues and, uh, and, and in particular with regard to, to pandemics. And what we see here uh, that uh, there are, um, you know, the highly developed countries uh, uh, at the top of this list, uh, which, which uh, suggests that those, these countries obviously are um, uh, the best prepared for any sort of global health risk. This was also uh, this. Um, index, it was first published in October 29, uh, 2019, uh, has uh, received quite high exposure. Uh, President Trump has mentioned it in, in, in February, saying that U.S. is, is the best prepared for, for, for uh, anything like the, the COVID uh, pandemic. What we see, unfortunately, today uh, is a sad day. Uh, we've passed the 1 million uh, death threshold, um, and we realize that there is some sort of uh, illusion of preparedness. So the what if thinking in terms of scenarios, what, what may happen um, if there is a little panic has come now to uh, the now what, to some sort of crisis management mode. Um, this crisis management or crisis uh, uh, perception, of course, is not only in the area of public health, but also in, uh, we know it quite well from others, including migration. And the, the, the perception that there's a constant crisis mode in the area of migration, I think uh, we are all familiar with. Um, there are different definitions of a crisis. Uh, I would like to refer to a definition coming from complexity science, which says crisis is a situation of a complex system, in particular when the system is temporarily dysfunctional. I think that's something we, uh, would uh, confirm uh, with regard to the migration system, if we uh, may call it uh, like that, and that there's a sort of a constant perception that migration policy and governance do not and does not address and cope with the full complexity of migration. And what is the complexity of migration? We have heard a lot today already about uh, com 
complex aspects of migration. There's the issue of super diversity, and not only more migrants, but really more diverse migrant populations uh, are migrating. Um, the boundaries between diverse migrant groups are getting increasingly blurred. That becomes increasingly challenging to identify and to target particular groups of of uh, migrants and would-be migrants. We see an increasing uh, a landscape of uh, actors that are engaging in the area of migration, including um, NGOs and and, uh, and 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 other actors, and we see obviously the whole uh, uh, notion of biased uh, uh, discourses and, and, and fake news. So, what can we do about this complexity when it comes to uh, uh, migration? What are adequate responses? First of all, I would like to start with. Uh, the understanding um, that uh, Professor Mabub Gunji, a, a Nigerian geographer, has already said a half century ago. He basically says, we need to consider migration no longer as a linear, unidirectional, push and pull, cause and effect movement, but as a circular, interdependent, progressively complex and self-modifying system in which the effect of changes uh, in one part can be traced to the whole system. So what we basically uh, need to start with this uh, to, uh, in, in terms of understanding migration is that we have to understand migration as part of an adaptive system, as an adaptive complex system. Um, Franz Willekens, uh, who's also um, part of the Quantmic project, he has uh, outlined some characteristics of a complex migration system. Uh, I don't go through this list uh, in detail, but what we uh, uh, I think have to bear in mind that uh, um, migration processes are basically building up from the bottom, so from the individual, from individual agents, and not only migrants and would-be migrants, but obviously all agents that are involved in migration processes. And these processes obviously are uh, sort of triggered by, by internal and external forces. Um, there's constant interaction, in exchange of information, exchange of resources, etc between agents um, and there's some sort of patterns evolving. So the emergence uh, um, of certain networks, um, but also the emergence of, 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 of migration patterns at the higher structural level, I think is, is a major feature of, of uh, complex migration systems. What's, uh, what's relevant, I think, in this kind of system thinking is that systems can be out of equilibrium. Sometimes they are, uh, sometimes they're not, sometimes they are in a very stable steady state uh, uh, situation, but usually there's some sort of uh, uh, disequilibrium um, or um, some sort of um, instability. Um, what is also part of the feature of complex systems is that there's, uh, they are affected by the epistemic and aleatory uh, uncertainties, and for that uh, reason, there's some limited um, predictability. So, in the spirit of Mabugunje, um, he's, he's asking and, and, and for more system-based uh, thinking when it comes to migration complexes. I think one key uh, aspect is that we have to understand migration tribal complexes. What drives migration? We are quick in identifying a few factors. Uh, in fact, we have done a systematic literature recently as part of a cross-migration project, it was mentioned already today, um, where we reviewed um, almost 400 uh, studies uh, who have looked into migration tribes. And on average, those studies study two to three drivers. Right. So a very limited number of migration tribes. It is, it is basically our field is very much uh, uh, characterized by a reductionist uh, perspective when it comes to migration tribes. So the claim here is that we, uh, we should more into, look into more complex tribal configurations and interactions rather than searching for some sort of root causes. So when it comes to uh, migration systems and change in, 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 in equilibria, um, I think you take more of the features into account that are characteristic of, of, of systems more generally. So um, shocks, whether they are sudden or gradual, cause uh, 
some sort of feedback, uncontrolled feedback, cascading effects, extreme events, etc., unwanted side effects. We know all that, um, and it's sort of illustrated here uh, by this. Uh, bucket uh, uh, type of, 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 of figure, um, you know, some smaller changes in um, migration flows we see all the time. You know, fluctuations are, are on the trend, but sometimes a sudden shock can shift an entire migration system uh, to a new level. Um, this can be a sudden shock or a gradual change of some underlying configuration that is driving uh, migration more, more generally. But there's some sort of tipping point that may um, may occur where a completely new level of migration uh, is, 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 is reached, some sort of, you know, regime change when it comes to uh, a particular migration process. What is also, I think, uh, uh, important to un un understand, in particular when it comes to identifying the drivers of migration, um, we have to first understand um, that migration drivers are usually embedded into broader configurations or driver networks or driver environments. And that we can observe for one and the same um, outcome, migration outcome, very different uh, causes or causal configurations. So this is um, what we also study in another Horizon 2020 project, uh, in the MICNEX project, uh, we study so-called INS uh, causations, so where individual uh, driving factors are actually embedded in broader migration complexes. So um, when it comes to um, sort of, you know, uh, regime changes and, and, and shifts in, in migration systems, we obviously have a, a whole range of, of, uh, of examples where this has happened. And we sometimes call these shocks or events uh, Splex ones, uh, like the, uh, the, the disaster uh, almost a decade ago in Japan with the, with the, uh, the, the nuclear accident in Fukushima. Um, so this is often uh, mentioned as a black swan uh, that obviously has led to uh, uh, you know, large-scale population evacuations, etc. Uh, but also some partial return, as you can see here on the right-hand uh, uh, slide. But it has led to a new, a new equilibrium, a new balance, a new population composition and configuration in that, in that uh, region. And basically the black swan are not is not necessarily a, a, a black swan, but a white swan, as Taleb would often say, um, uh, also with regard to other major events like COVID. It was foreseen, it was um, um, uh, mentioned by experts, not exactly when it may happen, but that it can happen and will happen at some point that makes a black swan a white swan. And this is what happened here in, uh, in Fukushima. Um, and uh, in, in other parts of the world, like here in the Arab uh, RLC region, where we see similar um, systemic risk. And that's another uh, concept I would like to refer to, the uh, systemic risk as you know, a risk that has the potential to destabilize a system, including a migration system. So migration control guises are coming back to that concept, I think, is some, in some ways system imminent. It's part of a, of a system. Um, the adaptation and the systemic change is constant, is ongoing. It is an intrinsic part of interconnected system. And we have to realize that adaptation and the limited control capacity um, are some sort of some key features of uh, complex migration governance. And here, I come uh, to the governance aspect. Uh, I think it is key to, first to uh, um, that, that, that you know stakeholders, including policymakers, uh, scientists, researchers, etc., and other stakeholders, think collectively of how to adapt and mitigate and prevent the manifestations of systemic risk. So, what what does it mean? Um, first, it uh, requires that we understand the underlying causes of systemic risk that are relevant for migration, obviously, uh, but in systems, in broader systems, in interconnected systems, obviously, a, um, a, a event may easily um, and quickly uh, uh, trickle uh, to, to uh, areas that are relevant uh, to migration and migration processes. So here, a sort of a list of uh, factors that may 
uh, uh, core systemic risk. I don't go uh, uh, through this in detail. Um, I rather uh, focus on um, the reasons that may cause policy failure because policy and the way governments respond to migration forecasts but also migration outcomes, so real-time outcomes, obviously uh, is part of a migration system and it's, a, it's an element of in, in tales and element of, of uncertainty. So in here, I think it is uh, key that we um, understand that migration policy has some limited effectiveness only. I mean, this is um, not rocket science. It is well established in literature that um, a migration, the, the element of, of managing and directing and, uh, and, 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 and regulating and controlling migration um, is only possible uh, in within within uh, some limits. Um, it is, uh, uh, I think, important to take into account that most policy interventions uh, uh, create some, some unintended effects. And obviously, um, this also has to do with the targeting aspects. And policies it, uh, usually um, have some target group um, uh, whether it is uh, the migrant's origin or the, the migrant type or if it's asylum seekers or some, some other migrant groups or the highly skilled that are targeted by a particular type of policy. But it has, you know, some spillover effects on other groups um, and also, of course, uh, regions and areas um, where migrants are coming from. Um, another aspect, of course, is the policy receptivity. Uh, so policies are not so, so they're equally received and internalized and responded to by uh, diverse populations. There's the issue of policy timing. Um, there is the, the, the well-documented, yes? Matthias, I to interrupt, but I think we, in the interest of time, uh, we need okay, to wrap I'm, up. Okay, I'm coming to my, my, <laughs> okay. my last slide. Thank okay, you very thank much. You. Um, so let, let me move to, to the last slide. Um, basically, how, coming back to the, you know, the starting question, how do we prepare for uncertain migration futures? I think it is it's important that we increase the capacity for good enough forecasting. So a lot of has been mentioned already today um, uh, with our data requirements, the, the you know, addressing epistemic uncertainty when it comes to knowledge, um, understanding uh, agency, human agency, I think is, is very key. There's interesting research going on in that area. And of course, understanding systemic interconnections. Um, enhancing smart and mainstream migration governance. This is, uh, I think, uh, a research area that is uh, uh, evolving rapidly, um, uh, mainstream migration in the area of governance, so creating multi-actor networks, um, in, enhancing uh, policy coherence, so uh, bringing uh, migration policies in line with other migration policies, of course, also nurturing evidence-based uh, uh, discourses, academic and public discourses. Um, and last but not least, uh, we need nevertheless be prepared to be unprepared. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Matthias. Uh, so we have about 12 minutes now for our panel discussion. Um, and I, there are a few questions that still came in for Michael, uh, which I would like to um, Translate or uh, um, transmit. So one was from uh, from Marie Helenius from the Finnish Ministry of Interior, and she asked, "Does the economic development of a certain country have any effect on the return migration to that country?" Then there is another question from Bernd Weber from Leibniz Institute for Economic Research, and he's asking what you make of the of the Schneider Heinze paper um, with the, where they, the OECD paper, where they are you um, in regard to the migration hump? Um, I think we spoke about this recently, Clemens, but um, Michael, but uh, he's asking, he would like to hear something, how to address sort of the fixed effect approach. And then there's another uh, question by André Gröger regarding the problem that we don't know the counterfactual. So how would EU origins have developed in the absence, in the absence of intra-EU migration? So the time is short. I'm not sure whether we have time to, uh, to answer them all, Michael, but maybe in a few minutes, that would be great. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? So, thank you very much. Uh, 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 from the, the Finnish, it's the Finnish Ministry of Interior, Finland. Is that what you said? Uh, 
Exactly. Uh, yes, about about return migration. So what what you uh, the the individual level data that you saw are, are from people uh, uh, surveyed in their country of origin, talking about their their. Uh, their uh, Im imminent uh, uh, preparation, their preparation to imminently emigrate. Uh, the the uh, the country level data you saw are about uh, 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 net changes in migrant stocks. So that is the sum total of emigration and 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 return migration, and uh, and. Uh, 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 it, it combines uh, the, the movement of people out and the movement of people in. Uh, it is uh, so, so. The the short answer is the analysis you saw does not uh, does not uh, directly address the, the tendency to to encourage return migration. Uh, I can think of uh, extraordinarily clear examples where that has happened. Korea is maybe the poster child of that. Uh, uh, there was a surge of immigration from Korea that accompanied its takeoff uh, in, into uh, into lower middle income, upper middle income, and now uh, high income status, and and uh, certainly re return migration uh, uh, to Korea. Uh, at a at a certain uh, uh, point, uh, was uh, was was very positively associated with uh, with migration. The, the same has happened in Mexico, uh, in the United States. Uh, certainly, the there was a net flow out uh, in in, uh, in in recent years. The the net flow from the the United States to, back to Mexico has been uh, negative. That, that's been true since somewhere around 2006, 2007, uh, uh, until the, just before the crisis. And of course, in the in this current crisis, all bets are off. Uh, but at, at that, uh, in those late stages of development, there is very clearly a, uh, a, a positive relationship between de development at home and, and the return of, of people. I don't know of good, good evidence for that in the early stages of development. Uh, if the, uh, it, it seems very clear that if, if the Gambia behaves like, uh, like other countries of its income level, uh, and, and again, it's such an, a nearly universal experience that that is a quite a reasonable expectation. That there will be a net flow out, but whether the the uh, uh, during that range, uh, while uh, Gambia remains a, a, a developing country, which is going to be be true uh, uh, certainly in any reasonable scenario for the the rest of our careers and perhaps lifetimes, uh, whether the whether the economic growth in the Gambia will encourage return, I, I don't know of good evidence for for that specifically. Um, the, the the second question was it Bernd Weber? Uh, uh, was uh, was about uh, the, this paper uh, uh, claiming that uh, that that all these relationships are are, are just an, an illusion and that, that that's not actually the the path that countries follow over time. Uh, uh, th th there is a uh, at the at, in my website which I linked to at the end of the of the presentation, which is just mclem.org. It's m c l e m dot o r g. You'll find a, a a link to a paper that goes on for. For pages about this issue, the, the, the bottom line is that these these results are are very highly robust to country fixed effects, which is just another way of saying that the the paths that individual countries in their own circumstances follow over time are extremely similar to the paths to, to the to the, the pattern that you see uh, uh, across countries. That is, the the immigration life cycle is not just a a a, a pattern that you observe in a in a snapshot of countries. It is a, it is indeed the the typical path that average countries. Have taken uh, over time, and and in that paper you'll see, for example, that the the cross country relationship between uh, uh, the the prevalence of migration and the and the development level uh, is uh, uh, the the percentage change in one versus the percentage change in the other is 0.3. That that is a a hundred percent increase in in GDP per capita. Uh, in across a snapshot of countries, a doubling of, of income per capita across a snapshot of countries is associated with a one third increase in the, the tendency of people to live outside it. If you uh, uh, ignore all information comparing one country to another and just look with it at the paths that countries have followed uh, 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 across time, you get uh, the, the same answer of 0.3. I would say one's 0.38 and the other's 0.35, but they, they are really uh, extremely similar. That, that is, we we do in fact learn a lot about uh, about the the path that low income countries are likely to follow as they develop by looking at the experience of countries that are somewhat richer than them. And in fact, when you think about it, uh, really th there should be a very strong burden of proof on anybody who would claim the opposite. That that in, that in fact, countries that are somewhat richer than than the Gambia might have very high migration, but that tells us absolutely nothing about what's going to happen to to the Gambia as it develops that that's quite a 
that's quite a strong claim, and I, I think anybody who, who studies economic development uh, would would uh, agree that uh, that, uh, that our, our presumption should be the opposite without strong evidence. Uh, in, in fact, uh, 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 a, a major technical error was made in that paper. Unfortunately, I talk about it at length in the in uh, in, in this analysis, but. Uh, the, 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 this is not really a controversial issue. Uh, if if you, you you saw the 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 data that I put on the screen before, it shows the the arrows, the raw data. There's no statistical analysis there. Uh, all of those countries have been moving up and to the right. Uh, it's nearly a universal experience of development that more and more people tend to live outside as countries develop. And uh, uh, if anybody's going to argue that that's just completely uh, illusory or, uh, or or uninformative about the future experience of development, uh, I just uh, I, I have a very difficult time understanding those uh, those assertions. And I, I've talked so much that, that that perhaps I should stop there, Yulia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we have five minutes left, and we have uh, questions for Teddy, Britt, and Matthias. I'm going to pause the questions to you, and then I uh, would ask you to. Uh, really respond in, in two minutes. Um, so, Matthias, one question to you is regarding the limited effect of migration policies. Could the effect increase if migration is understood as an adaptive complex system? The question to Britta is in regard to whether Germany's new system would allow stakeholders to react earlier than in 2014-2015. The, than in and um, whether the German presidency has been successful in joining efforts of EU countries and agencies and building up a network which coordinates and validates existing projections, forecasts, and scenario building. So maybe choose something of that very briefly. Um, and Teddy, a question to you would be, do you have a concrete example of when the information EASA provided led to a specific policy decision, policy change, or intervention? Maybe we can start with uh, Matthias. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a, a very important one. Um, the answer is, I think there's no no the no no deterministic mechanism that uh, um, basically leads to a certain migration outcome when it comes to migration policy. Migration policies uh, and their effectiveness depend a lot. On, um, on the way they are designed, the way they are communicated, and the way they are targeted. Um, and I think what we know is that policies that are, you know, going completely against the current are largely ineffective. They are largely ineffective with regard to the, the initial objectives or the stated objectives of, the, of a policy, but uh, it does not mean that they don't create the effects. They, they create effects but not necessarily the, the, the uh, intended, but the unintended. And I think that uh, makes it uh, uh, so complex to really monitor and, 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 and understand basically also um, the, the multiple ways migration policies can affect uh, migration processes and, 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 and um, you know, in the short term, but, but also in, in, in the longer term. So, um, we know that my, uh, my, my migration policies, um, um, you know, have some effects. I think that's a kind of a stylized fact. But uh, um, with regard to the level of effectiveness, uh, I think uh, we have to look really into particular context and the particular migration policy instruments. So this is, I think, we can't, cannot really say anything meaningful in more general terms. Okay. Thank you so much, Matthias. Brita. I have to unmute myself. I did. It. So, um, first question: um, the question was if uh, Germany will be better prepared uh, for a situation like 2015. I hope so, um, because that's exactly the aim of our new tool. And I'm quite confident that we still are. We are already better prepared now by creating this network of experts. Because uh, from my point of view, having this kind of structured dialogue on the migration situation um, creates a kind of pressure for the decision takers to act. And this is, uh, from my point of view, the most important thing. Um, I, I very much agree on this um, 
aspect on the white swarm, because I think uh, COVID-19 could have been uh, foreseen as well, because there were so many studies before, even in Germany in 2012, um, forecasting exactly a scenario like COVID-19. But it's, it's just about um, our way of handling these kind of structural risks or systemic risks. So this, to be brief on the first question and the second one, if the German presidency will be successful in, in creating this network, I hope so. And I'm, I'm quite looking forward to the presentation of Susanna, and I hope she will uh, tell us something more about the European plans. And I'm really proud that all these plans um, will be presented and implement. We are starting to implement them mm -hmm. through the German presidency. Great. Thank you so much, Frida. Teddy, you have the closing words. No, thank you very much. Some some responsibility. But yeah, so uh, so my question about uh, specific policies that have been based on our on our work. Well, you know, for for ESO, early warning means as early as possible, and so much of our work focuses on events taking place in in countries of origin and countries of transit. And of course, we don't have any say over the over the policy policy cycle in in those locations. What what tends to happen is when there's a sudden influx of arrivals or applications for asylum, we tend to run our analysis and um, make a judgment whether we think the influx is likely to continue or whether it's just about to um, to abate. And we've done that in uh, northern Syria. Uh, we've done that for um, uh, Latin America and uh, and for um, several other locations. And so this kind of feeds in a little bit. Into the, into the operational response, let's say. But as far as policy is concerned, so I would echo what Britta said. I'm also proud to be a part of the European project and the way that it's moving forward. And, um, and I'd also congratulate the European Commission for, for the pact last week, um, because this is a really clear example of the two-way street that I spoke about earlier, where you know people like me and our, our speakers today you know, we are charged with, with, with trying to produce better evidence, but we also ask the policymakers to give us the chance to have better data. And the European Pact that came out last week has several uh, legislative uh, upgrades, which includes much better data. So we're really licking our lips, and uh, we're waiting for that data to come through, and we hope that that's all approved and endorsed. And uh, believe me, we'll take forecasting to the next level. So. Mm -hmm. so we'll our uh, final note is watch this space. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we need to close this session. I would have loved to continue the discussion. I'm getting a lot of messages in the chat um, thanking all the speakers for the interesting presentation, and I can only second that. Thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your interesting insights with us. Um, we will take a break now, and we'll be back at uh, 3.45. Please do join us again for the last um, presentations and panels of the day. Thank you to all of you and see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.